Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning, so thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I'd like to begin just by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, who of course are the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting, and pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in the room today. <clears throat> I'm actually particularly proud to be able to celebrate uh, today an achievement that I learnt of yesterday, which was that under our Reconciliation Action Plan, uh, Telstra is committed uh, to double the representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within our workplace. Uh, and within the business unit that I've looked after for the past four and a half years, Telstra Enterprise, uh, as of 1 July last year, we actually had a disappointing number um, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our workforce, just 0.26%, which was 18 people. In the past nine months, we've actually made um, significant efforts and we've doubled that as of yesterday. So I'm uh, really happy about that. It's very easy, of course, to give an acknowledgement of country, but actually really making a difference is the important thing to do. Um, a couple of things to know about me um, before we get started. So the first thing is that this week I am actually suffering from a severe debilitating illness, uh, commonly known as man flu. Uh, <clears throat> so excuse my voice, which is a little bit gravelly. I have taken a lot of codril um, and I have tissues in my back pocket, but hopefully I will get through the next half hour without needing too much. Uh, the other thing to know about me is that uh, since accepting this invitation to speak, uh, Telstra HR has gone through what I think is known in local parlance as a reshuffle. Uh, and so uh, I've actually changed my role from uh, the person looking after Telstra Enterprise, uh, our, our sort of business and government uh, arm, to uh, being in charge of talent and organisational effectiveness. What does that mean? So I'm actually now responsible for Telstra's workforce planning and labour strategy, for our recruitment and talent, for capability, learning, leadership, um, diversity and inclusion. I think that's about it. But anyway, in actual fact, what I'm going to talk about today is probably more relevant to the new role that I'm going to than to my old role. So um, if I do a good job, please let my boss know that she made the right decision. Uh, so I want to talk about three things today. A little bit about Telstra and some context for the other things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about how technology is actually changing uh, our workplace and the way that we work. And the third thing is then to talk about how as our business transforms, we are helping our people to transform by uh, building new skills for them, for the capabilities that they need for the future. So our vision as a company is to become a world-class technology company that empowers people to connect. That isn't about moving away from being a telecommunications company, in fact, quite the opposite. It's really because we're a telecommunications company and because technology innovation is changing our industry so much that we need to become a technology company. Uh, now, it's very easy to say that. People often say today, technology is changing everything. Technology is indeed changing every business within Australia. But I think for Telstra and for telecommunications companies, it means something quite specific. And so there's a dreadful typo up there on the slide, but what the first point should actually say is that the traditional worlds of telecommunications and computing are converging. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about it, there's very little technology innovation that is happening today that is not intended to be connected. So think about it, things like drones, uh, driverless cars, uh, cloud computing, high definition video, uh, augmented reality, the internet of things. All of those things rely on one particular thing, which is a secure, um, high quality, fast, reliable, secure telecommunications network. And at Telstra, of course, we have a very long and proud history of building such networks. We have deep skills in electrical and network engineering, and we've applied those over the past 100 years to build the best network in Australia. The second reason for the change of emphasis about becoming a world-class technology company is the second point up there. So demand is growing exponentially. We know that uh, our networks carry more and more traffic in an exponential fashion every year. But in actual fact, the value um, is not in the data growth. The value is actually in the things that lie on top of that network. So if I take a very uh, simple example of Netflix. Uh, uh, Netflix, how many people in the room have Netflix? 
Okay, so all of you guys pay Netflix, I think it's now $14.99 uh, a month. Uh, you consume that over a telco network, hopefully our network, um, and it uses a lot of data. And we have doubled, you know, earlier on this year, I think it was in December or January, we doubled the data on our consumer plans, but we didn't actually charge anyone any more for that. Uh, and that's something that you see across the industry on mobiles and on home plans. So the value for the company is not necessarily in selling more, uh, more sort of uh, traffic over our network. The value actually lies in those things that sit on the network. It's Netflix who's making the money out of that stuff. So similarly as a company, we have to say, how do we shift what we do, not from just being about connectivity, but to actually selling those things that sit on top of the network. And the business that I've uh, worked in for the past four and a half years, our um, enterprise business does a lot of that through our network applications and services business. So our vision isn't necessarily about losing sight of the traditional core business, but it's actually about recognising what a telco looks like in the future. So looking at this, what will a telco look like in the future? Well, I think the thing that's different is that you move from connectivity being something that makes up the majority of value to actually saying it's still important, but there's a much higher contribution from things like software and platforms and content. And what that means for us is that we actually have to build a lot of new skills in new areas. Software engineering, uh, data science, machine learning, uh, AI, all of those sorts of skills, because that's increasingly how networks are actually built and how they'll be built in the future. So I'm not going to go through um, all of our corporate plan here, but what I did want to highlight um, were the things that are actually at the bottom, which are the strategic enablers in there, because they're the things that I think most contribute to the shift that we have to make as an organisation in terms of skills and the way that we uh, work. So I said before, the importance of networks. Uh, Networks of the future are very different though. I mean, I'm not an engineer, so I will probably say this in really basic language and an engineer would actually cringe if they were to hear me talking about this. But you know, traditional networks rely on uh, sort of boxes and widgets and they kind of, uh, you know, our, our network engineers design all of these uh, boxes and you'd be used to having those sorts of things in the home in the past. Uh, the networks of the future are software enabled. So we talk about what we call software defined networking, which is a very different skill, which is about saying, Rather than getting extra network capacity through building more things, you try and make your existing uh, network smarter by using software to get more out of it. Um, those are, of course, new skills for us. Uh, second thing, digitizing ourselves. Um, so McCall talked a little bit before about um, customer experience and the need for change there. We all know that customers want a digital experience. And of course, that's no different for us. So we are having to digitize um, all of our systems to provide a different employee experience and customer experience. And then finally, of course, culture and capabilities. Very important, something uh, very dear to my heart, which is how do we work differently in the future? We know we've got to be more agile. We know we've got to be more collaborative. We need different leadership, different work environments. But what does that really mean? So I'll come on to talk a little bit about our workforce and uh, how we're then changing our environment. So our workforce is very diverse. Uh, we have six major worker types across sort of mo um, a mobile field force uh, with several thousand employees. We have people working in retail stores, in contact centres, and a significant number of people also who are office-based workers. You can see the employee demographics are very varied. People are across both CBD and suburban and regional locations, and we have a significant number of employees who also work internationally. And also, of course, the nature of employment's changing. Uh, we talked before about the the gig economy, and increasingly we see that we're working more with partners, contractors, consultants, freelancers, that sort of thing. So the challenge in all of that is how do you actually work better across different geographies, different business units, and how do you really collaborate with partners um, as well as employees to get work done? So we've kind of done that in two ways. The first way is through um, All Roles Flex. So this, uh, a few years ago, actually, uh, when we uh, launched our new purpose and values as an organisation, we took a very, very strong position on workplace flexibility. And so, in essence, what we offer is flexibility as the starting point for every employee. People are encouraged to speak to their manager about how they can perform their role flexibly. 
Um, now, of course, many organisations have these policies, but I think the difference for me about Telstra, and I hear this a lot from employees who come from other places to work at Telstra, is that we really, really live it, and we live it at all levels of the organisation. So to give you, you know, a personal example, um, when I'm not doing human resources, uh, my partner Nathan and I actually own a farm. In fact, I live on a farm. I don't live in the city. I live 70 kilometres and about 70 minutes north of Melbourne uh, where we breed Arabian horses. Uh, so I actually work from home twice a week. Uh, I have uh, fixed wireless NBN, which is actually very good, which means I can do uh, a lot of video calling and stuff like that from home. But it also means that I can feed the horses in the morning and the evening a couple of days a week to help my partner out. Um, you know, that's, that's something that goes on sort of throughout our workforce. And what that's actually driven that kind of increased flexibility um, is a lot more workforce mobility. Um, the other thing that I think has changed what we need to do in the, in the workplace is, of course, agile ways of working. So we've um, heard it from previous speakers talking about the fact that you're moving from that traditional environment of being in a fixed team to being an employee who's deployed a lot more to agile teams. And so you'll have to go and work on different projects from time to time. You're not sitting in a fixed place. So our workplace, of course, has to reflect that. How many people here in the room today actually still have an office? Okay, a fair few. So, um, what, what we actually did a few years ago was uh, start to redesign all of our workplaces, and we're pretty much done on doing it. And this was a program that we ran called Future Ways of Working. And so what we actually did was we started by conducting some observations about the way that people actually use the space within the office. And what we found was that people are actually only at their desks about 35 to 60% of the time. The rest of the time they're working from home or in meetings or uh, doing other stuff, out seeing customers, I hope. Um, and so we saw an opportunity to repurpose some of that space for um, better collaboration and to allow people more of an opportunity to actually bump into each other, uh, to collide in the workplace, and so hopefully drive innovation. And so what we landed on initially was a ratio of seven and a half desks for each 10 people. We've actually since revised that downwards, I think, to seven desks per 10 people, because we found that we still had quite a lot of unused space. And then what we did was use the savings that we made, or some of we look, we banked some savings, got to be honest, but we used some of the savings that we made through that to actually increase uh, our workplace technology. So uh, all uh, rooms now that we have on our floors are video conference enabled. Um, we have really great Wi-Fi networking throughout the floors. Um, there's, um, all employees have really great access to video on their laptop. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. And then we also collaborated with our architects to, try to, to create a design that uh, met our needs for the future and uh, meant that we would have happy employees. So I might just show a quick video that talks about this. Future way of work is a concept about how do I constantly innovate, how do I leverage the changing technology, the changing environment, the changing science about how we can become more productive and more engaged. We're asking people to take control of their day and we're empowering people to be able to choose the best area for them to be most effective and productive. Genuinely can we think the way work is done, bring incredible productivity and also excitement and fun to the way that work can be delivered in the future. People connecting with each other in person rather than via email, and they're building strong relationships with each other. You're not just applying technology change, you're also applying business change and a cultural change, and you create an organisation that, that people want to work for.
Awesome. So in terms of the actual layout that we went with, um, one of the goals was really to stimulate collaboration between teams. And so we went with very open floors uh, with flexibility to move between the floors. So you may have seen on the video, a lot of our floors are now actually connected through staircases, not just the fire escape. There's actually a, a staircase in the main work area. And that's really great. You, I run up and down them all the time when I'm in Sydney. Um, we also found when we were going through the pilot of this that we actually had to transition between particular spaces within the workplace. So you'll see up there, there's a blue area, which is the kind of social area that the floor opens onto, large uh, kitchen area, it tends to be a little bit noisy. Um, and so then we kind of moved around into the orange areas, which are areas that teams can actually book to connect in. So say you're working on an agile project with five other people and you want to actually book a workstation for the six of you, you can actually do that and you can work in collaboration in that area and know that you can sit there on the open plan floor. Then as you move around into the green area, uh, you start to move to more individual desks where people can you know, just turn up and, and choose a desk uh, from day to day. And then finally, uh, there's a sort of peace and quiet area, which is the pink area there, uh, which we call full focus, where um, can you believe it for a telecommunications company, we actually say no phone calls. So um, those were the sort of zones that we went with on our floors. And what we actually have found over the past few years is that, I won't go through all of this, uh, but it's really, really increased um, our engagement. Uh, as I say, we've made savings, but been able to um, reinvest those into technology. Um, and over four out of five people actually don't want to go back to uh, the old working environment. So we've now rolled this out um, across the majority of our offices around the world. Uh, we've just actually, we're just about to complete the transformation of our Melbourne HQ, and I've recently visited our Singapore office where we changed, we've done the same in London and Hong Kong. Actually, interestingly, on, in Hong Kong, one thing that we did differently there, which reflected local practice, was I don't know if anyone's lived in Hong Kong, but uh, flats in Hong Kong are actually really, really small. Like, tiny, tiny, um, and you also tend to have um, helpers or family who will live in the home with you. So very few people actually want to work from home because there's nowhere uh, that you can actually do that effectively. So we actually stayed with fixed desks for people in Hong Kong because, you know, 98% of the workforce actually do come into the office and sit at the same desk every day. Um, but anyway, I, I think it has been a huge success for us. I um, myself have really enjoyed it. Things I particularly like about it are firstly having a stand-up desk. Uh, it's amazing, you know, we all hear about health at work and things like that. Uh, I love being able to stand because I spend a lot of my time on my bum in meetings. So uh, when I'm at my desk, being able to stand is great. Um, I do love the technology. So one of the things that I particularly like is video calling um, and the ability to do that from my laptop. So we at the moment use a technology called Cisco uh, Jabber. Uh, actually this week we launched uh, a, a new uh, thing called Telstra Calling with Microsoft, which is through their Office 365 uh, suite. But what that actually enables me to do is whether I'm at home, in the office, in an airport, in a hotel, I can actually join a video conference. Um, in fact, uh, Immediately after I speak, I actually have to go and speak with my colleagues to the CEO about people stuff, and I can just go straight upstairs to my room, and I can actually join that on a video call, which is pretty cool. So that's uh, a little bit about the, the workplace and the changes that we made there. I'll just skip over this slide in the interest of time. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about finally was just a little bit about the changes that we're having to make to our skill mix. And I could talk all day um, about culture and capability. Uh, what I just wanted to show on this slide was, you know, our vision for, um, within Telstra HR is to create better ways for our people to thrive at Telstra. And so we primarily do that through looking at the employee experience and using human-centered human design to do that. And there's various dimensions to that. Uh, it's important, as we t uh, our previous speaker talked about, you know, the different types of leadership we need for the future. That's another whole uh, topic in itself. Culture is another whole topic in itself as well. But what I wanted to talk about was capability. And so the challenge that we had was, how do you transform your workforce's skills where you believe that basically a third of people this is a workforce of 32,700, a third of those people are gonna be significantly impacted by the changes that we have going on in our industry. How do you actually help them transform that capability in just a few years? 
And so we tackled capability first because it was the area that we thought there was most scope for change. And it's also the logical first step. So you need to be clear as an organization on the skills and capabilities that you need for the future. And then you actually have to have what we call a buy, build, borrow strategy to actually say, how are you going to fill those things? And of course, there are those three ways that you can do it. You can buy in new talent, you can build your new talent within, or you can borrow talent by going and working with partners who have that talent. Now, our preference as an organization is very much to build. Um, that's partly because it's actually the most cost-effective thing to do, and it's partly because we actually owe that to our workforce. You know, we have uh, really great, talented employees, but as skills change, so for example, you know, if you're a network engineer, in the future, you probably need to morph to being more of a software engineer. How do we actually help people do that? And how do you do that on a large scale? So that was the challenge for us. And to be honest, we came from a really low base point. So we were making very reactive, isolated decisions about our workforce. When we looked across the company, we actually had over 70 different capability frameworks, all of which described the capabilities attached to roles in very different ways. And so our people felt disempowered, and I think they were quite scared about the future. So what did we do to change all of that? So the first thing that we did was actually put together an enterprise labor strategy. So we said, okay, if we want to be a world-class technology company that empowers people to connect, what are the capabilities that we actually need to deliver on that strategy in terms, and we talked about some of those earlier. Um, then what we did was actually go out and ask our employees, um, how do you want us to do this? So we used human-centered design, and we worked over the past 12 months uh, you know, using very collaborative, agile methodologies to actually produce what I think is quite a simple solution to a complex problem. So what did we actually deliver? So what we've delivered is a common career model for the whole organization. Now that's quite big, it's, it sounds very simple, but it's actually not. So we defined 486 jobs that we have across Telstra, both jobs that we have today and jobs that we know we are going to need in the future. So for example, you know, 12 months ago, we had no data scientists at Telstra, but we know that we need data scientists in the future. So we actually had to go out there and define exactly uh, what that role was and <clears throat> how that was going to work. So then for each one of those roles, we defined all of the capabilities. There's 140 capabilities in total that um, we think we need as an organization, and we defined each one of those at four levels, skilled, advanced, expert, and mastery. And so for every one of the jobs in the organization, you can go in and you can see which are the capabilities that you need for that role and at what level you actually require them. So, for example, uh, I'll actually look up today. When you go into the system, uh, you, you, um, what we ask employees to do is go in and enter all of their current skills, so you have a profile in my career. It looks a little bit like a quite kind of LinkedIn profile, where you put all of your past experience as an employee, including things you did prior to Telstra. And then we can actually match you with the um, jobs that there are across the organization. So I can tell you, for example, I'm an 81% match for the CEO role at Telstra. So, you know, a, a bit of a way to go there. Thankfully, I'm 100% matched for the role that I'm in, but I'm 54% matched for being a software engineer. Uh, and so why is that? Well, I've got skills in driving accountability, um, but I haven't got skills in applying agile practices or building software or designing software. But then what the system does is it actually then links it through to what we call learning pathways, which effectively is saying, hey, if you're currently um, just skilled in software uh, engine, in, say building software, but to become a senior software engineer, you actually need to be an expert in that. What are the things that you can do, both experiences and courses that you can do online to actually get you there? And all of this is actually now digitally enabled. So I will finish by just playing you a quick video about uh, the system that we now call My Career, which is hopefully going to enable us to really transform our employees' experience and help them build their capabilities for the future. Thank you. 
the colonization, at the same time the people who else is out there, it opens a whole window of opportunities to explore. My career allows me to put in what skills I can and do self-assessment of them as well. And that's valuable information for other people who would look at my profile. It could be from languages to travel and what you can offer to Telstra outside your career boundaries. The great thing about my career is it does give you visibility about what other roles may exist out there in the business. It enables me to go exploring and then it gives me options of other roles that I might not have even known about. When I do go to have that development conversation with my manager, I've got a solid foundation to work with, so I know exactly where my skill sets are. And I also know what areas that I want to develop if there's something that I want to move into from a career perspective. Sometimes it tends from being this enormous organisation, sometimes it's real difficult to find out who's who in this room. My career has been put a face to the name. I know a bit about the person overall and actually directly contact them. I think it's brilliant to go to uh, connect and find more about the people you meet in your day-to-day -day work as well. When you're ready for your next role at Telstra, you can download your My Career profile and use it as a resume template so that everybody can see all of your skills and expertise as well as some personal information. The menu page allows me to see my pay, allows me to enter leave, and also to look at my learning and development and performance opportunities. What I love about My Career is really how it makes accessing and talking about your career so easy. No matter what way I want to access it, I can do that. Excellent. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope that gives you a little bit of a glimpse into some of the things that we're doing as an organisation to, to realise our vision. Thank you.